Irregularities or discontinuities such as holes and notches effectively increase the nominal or theoretical stress as we move closer and closer to them. The theoretical stress we calculated for a part with the stress concentration at a location where the stress concentration is present is the same stress we would normally calculate with our mechanics of materials tools, only multiplied by a stress concentration factor KT or KTS for normal or shearing stresses respectively. However, these KTs that we often find by looking at stress concentration factor plots that depend on the geometric parameters and stress type only applies to static loading. Stress concentration factors still exist for dynamic loading, and we call them fatigue stress concentration factors, KF or KFS. Interestingly, the fatigue strength is not affected as much as stresses are by notches or other stress concentrations. The fatigue stress concentration factor is defined as the fatigue strength of a notch-free specimen over the fatigue strength of a notched specimen. So even though it's effectively defined as affecting the material property fatigue strength, it can be used as a stress increase in the nominal stress, just like KT or KTS for static loading. The fact that the sensitivity is reduced when going from a static to dynamic loading, that is, from static to fatigue analysis, comes mainly from the fact that the notch stress affecting the fatigue life is not the maximum stress at the notch, but instead it's the average stress acting over a volume of material close to the notch. Adding to this, any crack that is in fact initiated at a notch will be growing into a region with stresses that are much lower than at the stress concentration. However, not everything about why the effective stress concentration being lower for fatigue is fully understood. We define notch sensitivity Q as KF-1 over KT-1 and QS for shearing as KFS-1 over KTS-1. Since all Ks are expected to increase the theoretical stress and are therefore 1 or higher, this definition for sensitivity is basically comparing, as a ratio, the percentage of increase KF-100% for fatigue to the percentage of increase KT-100% for static loading. And since the information we have access to, based on experimental data, is the notch sensitivity Q, these expressions are rearranged to find KF as a function of KT and Q, or KFS as a function of KTS and QS for shearing. Notch sensitivities will depend on the notch radius, x-axis, and sometimes the ultimate strength of the material, represented by the different curves. And since they are the result of experimental measurements, they are also material specific. For example, notice that not only the values but also the behavior of steels is different to that of the aluminum alloys. Even though the fatigue stress concentration factor doesn't fully affect the theoretical calculations for cycles in the low cycle region of SN diagrams, that is, for cycles between 1 and 1000, and the actual value of the fatigue stress concentration factor is somewhere between 1 and KF for those numbers of cycles, a conservative approach that is commonly used is to just follow the expression to calculate KF, regardless of how many cycles the part is going to be subjected to. Let's look at a problem where we put together what we've learned in the past three main videos. A rotating shaft simply supported in ball bearings at A and C is subjected to a non-rotating force F of 500 newtons right in the center between A and C. The shaft is machined from a 1035 cold drawn steel. And I know that the radius of the notch is 9 eighths of a millimeter. I want to estimate the life of the part. Remember that these problems have two very distinct parts that almost have nothing to do with each other. One calculating the fatigue strength and one calculating the stress. So let's start with the fatigue strength first. And even though it's not necessary to solve the problem, having an SN diagram will definitely help us to understand it better. We know that the part will fail when the stress is equal to the strength of the material, in this case, the fatigue strength. And that is why we need the SN diagram, because it will give us the fatigue strength for a specific number of cycles, which is what we're looking for. We know that to fully define the SN diagram, we need to find the F coefficient and the endurance limit, so we know where the inflection points occur. We also know that the F coefficient will be a function of the ultimate strength and that we can look it up specifically for steels by looking at the F coefficient plot that we've used before. After looking at the ultimate strength for the 1035 steel, I find that the tensile strength is 550 megapascals. And for 550 megapascals, the F coefficient that I find is 0.875, roughly in the middle between 0.87 and 0.88. Having F and therefore the product between F and SUT, I can draw the line for the low cycle region. 
Now the other value is finding the endurance limit. I know that my first estimate for the endurance limit is going to be half of the ultimate strength as we defined it a couple videos ago. But I also know that I should probably use the Marin factors to get a more accurate estimate. Since neither the temperature nor the reliability were defined for this problem, I won't be using KD or KE. However, I know that the surface finish, meaning the surface factor, the size factor, and the loading factor are all important and I should take them into consideration. From our previous video, we know that depending on the surface finish and the ultimate strength value, we can calculate the surface factor. Since our part was machined and our ultimate strength is in megapascals, I use the corresponding values for the factor A and the exponent B to calculate Ka. From what we know about the size factor, we can calculate the value for Kb if we know the diameter of our part. And in this case, it doesn't need to be an equivalent diameter because the part is in fact a shaft and it is rotating. And notice that I'm using the diameter for the smaller section since that is where the maximum stress is gonna occur. Finally, for the loading factor, I know that this rotating shaft is going to be subjected to bending, a completely reversed normal stress, which results in a Kc of 1. And therefore, my endurance limit accounting for the Marin factors is equal to 197.3 megapascals, which is the other value I need to know for the second inflection point of the SN diagram. With this, I have fully defined the fatigue strength for any number of cycles for this part specifically. Now comes in the second part, where I look at the stress that the part is subjected to, completely independent from the strength analysis. I know that the part is subjected to bending, and that to calculate that bending, I need to find the moment that is causing the maximum value for the stress. That maximum stress may either be where the moment is maximum or where the stress concentration occurs. In this case, it's pretty clear that the maximum normal stress will occur at the notch since the maximum moment happens where the cross-section area has a diameter that is three times as big as the smaller diameter. In this case, it's pretty obvious that the maximum stress will occur at the notch since for the maximum moment, even though it's 50% higher than the moment at the notch, the diameter is three times as big and therefore the stress will be 27 times smaller since the diameter is cubed in the denominator of the stress equation. For any other case where you don't know if the stress is going to be higher at the maximum moment or at the notch, you evaluate the stress for all the candidate locations that you find. So let's do that for this example as a practice exercise. I know that the moment at D is 75 newton meters and that the moment at B is 50 newton meters. The stress at D where the maximum moment occurs will be equal to 8.35 megapascals using a diameter of 45 millimeters. The moment at B, without using the stress concentration factor yet, would already be way higher than that at 151 megapascals. So I know that the higher stress will occur at point B, where the notch is located. All I need to do now is find the fatigue stress concentration factor Kf. And to do that, I need the stress concentration factor for static loading Kt and the notch sensitivity Q. Remember, not KTS or QS, since these are normal stresses, not shearing. Since the larger diameter capital D is equal to 45 millimeters and the lowercase d is equal to 15 millimeters, I know that the D over D ratio is equal to 3. Checking the value of the radius of the notch and using it to find the ratio R over D, we find that the value for the x-axis is going to be 0.075 exactly between 0.05 and 0.10, which if we're looking at the curve of d over d equal to 3, gives us a kt of 2.0, right between 1.8 and 2.2. Looking at the notch sensitivity plot and using an ultimate strength of 550 megapascals, which is exactly between 400 and 700 megapascals, and using the same radius for the notch of 1.125, which is one fourth of the way from 1 to 1.5 millimeters, I would get a value slightly higher than 0.7. I will assume Q equal to 0.72. Using these two values and the expression we learned in today's video, I can calculate the fatigue stress concentration factor and find that is equal to 1.72. I can now go back to my stress at B and multiply that nominal slash theoretical value by the stress concentration factor for fatigue. And since I'm sure that that is the maximum normal stress that the part will be subjected to, that's the stress that will make the part fail when it exceeds the decreasing fatigue strength. 
to find the number of cycles for which the constant stress of 260 megapascals will be equal to or exceed the fatigue strength and therefore cause the part to fail, I used a relationship that we derived a couple videos ago. N would be equal to the stress over A to the 1 over B, which means I need to calculate my coefficients A and B. A would be equal to 1174 megapascals, and the B exponent would be equal to minus 0 0.1292. And therefore, the number of cycles for the fatigue strength to come down to 260, which is the external stress, would be 116,760 cycles. If you'd like to check out some other examples where we put together everything we've learned so far about fatigue, make sure to check out the links in the description below. So far, we've looked at completely reversed stresses, which means that the mean stress is zero and the alternating stress goes from a negative to a positive value. In the next video, we'll look at the fluctuating stress diagrams, which will allow us to calculate a factor of safety for any fluctuating stress that is not centered at zero. Thanks for watching.